Complicated Creation by Elemental, Chapter Ten: The Friends You've Made Along the Way. Izuku comes to awareness slowly. He's been sleeping a lot. He knows. He's been so tired as of late, and he's comfortable and doesn't want to shake this softness off to face another day. This softness isn't real, but he'll cling to it as long as he can. And the smell of antiseptic cuts through the fog of sleep. The softness is suddenly an oppressive weight blankets pulled tight across his chest, coldness against his left hand, and a pressure that implies a bandage. The smell of metal. Mostly female voices drift in from a distance, and then the ring of a phone. Izuku will never forget the sounds, these smells, this feeling. His eyes open and confirm he's in a hospital bed. He's not restrained as he throws himself forward, yanking at the blankets, grabbing at the IV pole to shut off the feed of whatever they're putting into him. He doesn't realize he's keening, breath short and sharp and painful. Doesn't realize he's not alone as he reaches for the power to get out of there, and realizes he doesn't have enough. Not yet. Not yet. And if they drug him again, will he even remember how to? And Deku. Solid hands touch him from behind, and Izuku flails out and lands a solid punch on the nurse, which is stupid. They'll think he's a threat. Now they'll restrain him. Now the. It's not a nurse. Eraser head has both hands up and empty, and moves more towards the foot of the bed. It's all right, Deku. I'm right here. I didn't leave. You passed out last night. You're safe. I'm here. Just breathe. It's a litany, and one Izuku realizes he's been hearing and ignoring since he first woke up. He wheezes as the tension in his chest lets go, and he falls forward on the bed, gasping for air. Aizawa puts his hands on the bed in front of Izuku. Let's him see them, then gently rubs his back in small circles. You've been asleep for eleven hours. I've been with you, or had Muriel with you, when they called me to look in on Ari. You had a concussion. The doctor treated that, and then they ran some blood tests because you didn't wake up. The IV is just fluids. I asked them to only do what was absolutely necessary until you woke up. Izuku tries his best to breathe, each gasp coming a little easier than the last. Aizawa keeps going. You're not crazy, Deku. I promise you that. No one here will sedate you or use their quirk against you. You have my word. Izuku manages to sit up and rubs at his face. The IV tugs at his hand, but Aizawa is more important. Aizawa looks exhausted, and his hair is messy, and his expression is worn, but his voice is kind, and his hands are gentle, and he stayed with Izuku all night. And Izuku doesn't want to cry, but he feels his vision swimming anyway. I'm sorry, he says, voice hitching. I'm nothing. You need to apologize for. Aizawa cuts him off. He reaches for the roller clamp on the IV line, and Izuku winces. But Aizawa just checks it to make sure it's shut. Thanks for not just yanking that out. He intones so dry, Izuku has to chuckle wetly. I might have done that before. He admits, trying not to think about that memory too hard, eyeing the drip to make sure it's really stopped. It makes a mess. I'll check with the nurse if we can take it out as soon as you're settled. Aizawa promises, and Izuku is so grateful. His eyes well up again, and he has to scrub his face to try to keep them from taking over. How do you feel? Izuku takes stock. Like I've been hit by a truck. Aizawa nods slowly, looking thoughtful. And you've been hit by a truck before, have you? That makes him laugh. No, no, just a bike. But it feels like that. But if it was a really big bike, he shivers. He shivers less from the cold than from the shock and adrenaline. Sorry, he winces as he says it because Aizawa glares at him for freaking out. I, ah,、uh, no. Aizawa cuts him off again. That's why I stayed with you. I wasn't gonna have you wake up alone. It doesn't matter. He reaches and collects the blankets and pulls it firmly over Izuku's lap, nudging him to settle while raising the bed to support his back. What do you remember from last night? Eri! The memory hits him hard, and he's looking around, but there's no sign of any spirit nearby. And Izawa puts a hand on his chest before he can try to get up. Is she all right? No wonder he's so tired. He'd bored everything he had into fixing her, warming her up. And it had felt like trying to melt a glacier with his breath. Stable, Aizawa says quickly. Her quirk hasn't flared up since you did, whatever it is you did. I didn't fix it, Izuku admits, looking at his hands as they grip the blanket in his lap. It's really damaged. 
shattered. I've never felt anything like it. I have to do a lot more. He drags his eyes up and takes a breath and does his best not to look away from Aizawa's gaze. I'm going to have to keep helping her for a while. I don't know how long, but I can't. I won't leave her like that. He doesn't want to seem ungrateful or pushy, but no one is going to be able to undo what was done except for him. Tell me about it. Aizawa doesn't seem surprised at his declaration. What's wrong with Harry's cork? Is it good witnesses? It's been shattered. Everyone else has been you and Sunny Deer and Arabity. You were disconnected. And it was like someone had just gone in with a knife and cut you apart. The power they gave you was there, but you couldn't use it anymore. I had to... He gestures with his hands, trying to symbolize it. I tied you back together. Like a bridge, Izuku thinks to himself, not sure if the thought makes him want to laugh or sigh. But her power is there and all tangled up, like it's been cut and reconnected a hundred thousand times. It feels so brittle. Chisaki's cork allowed him to disassemble and reassemble her. Aizawa says tonelessly. Would that... He killed her and then brought her back to life? Aizawa blinks like he hadn't intended to phrase it quite that way. But he nods once. Yes. Gods! Izuku covers his face with a hand and just rubs at his eyes, digging his fingers in at his temples. He feels ill at the thought. When you die, your power is supposed to go back to the spirit who gave it to you, and then they move on if they want another human or do their own thing. Not, not that. That explains why your spirit seemed to take offense at you helping. Aizawa suggests, and Izuku is just so grateful that this man understands now. He thought I was going to attack him. Izuku is still a little sore from being thrown around. I I think he thought I'd take his name and just keep him for myself. I I did that once. I was eight, and I didn't know any better. He knows Aizawa isn't likely to judge him after everything that he said, but it's still something he's ashamed of. When I was small, when I realized I could, I tried to take Mom's quirk. I wanted a quirk, a spirit of my own, so badly, and I thought... He thought a lot of things, but it had spent two days terrified fighting against him, and when Izuku had finally let it go, it never returned to the house, not once. I never do that now. They always think I will, no matter what I say. They think what I did to Toga was just the start, but... He doesn't need to whine about how unfair the spirits are. They're spirits, and they've always been this way. Tamamono may helped and convinced airy spirits I was there for airy, which is good, because, uh, he's a dragon! And he'd called Tamamo no Mei something else. Their conversation pretty obviously showed they knew one another, which might have maybe saved Izuku's life. I've never met a dragon before. They're so rare. So she convinced him to let you help, and you did. As that one nods. You passed out not long after that. I might have used up most of my power. Izuku agrees, feeling like he's forgetting something. It seemed like the best choice I could make at the time. I know you and Tamamo no Mei would look after me. Aizawa looks at him in surprise that turns into something soft, and he smiles just a little, and Izuku feels his teeth warm. I'm going to have to do more for her, I think, at least a few more times, but I think her spirit won't attack me again, and... The rest of the night before he'd passed down hits him in a sudden flash of so many teeth. And Izuku stiffens as he remembers the spirit who'd appeared next to Ryo, familiar and yet not. And the way Mirio had stiffened and the way Aizawa had cursed and... Oh! Oh. I think you were hoping I didn't remember the last bit. He winces looking through his bangs at Aizawa. About Muriel? Aizawa's lips go thin as he frowns and then sighs. You sure you didn't just see a spirit that looked like All Might's? Izuku considers that, but... Spirits aren't just how they look, he admits, picking his words carefully. They can change how they look a lot of the time. It's how we felt. I never met a spirit that had two humans before. Aizawa blinks in surprise at that. 
and then nods like Izuku's figured something out. I can't say much about it, the man says after a moment, shifting to sit at the foot of Izuku's hospital bed. But Mirio is All Might's successor. Izuku thinks about All Might, deflated and small. He'd wanted to help so badly, but he'd been too late and so far away. He'd run away from the hero students at Kamino Ward in case they'd tried to chase him, moving into the spirit realm and then out again at a shrine at Hamamatsu. By the time he could make his way back, it would have been far too late, and so he'd made his way to Musutafu and camped outside Yue's walls instead, waiting for All Might to return to teaching. His spirit had been one of the most intimidating ones Izuku had met in appearance alone. A lion's body with scaled legs and taloned feet, a segmented tail like a scorpion, leathery wings that get close to its body, and a lion's head with rows and rows upon rows of teeth. It had met him outside Yue's walls, aggressive and angry, and rebuffed him at first until Izuku had finally broken down. He would have given anything to save All Might, and had said as much, and the spirit had finally taken pity on him and told him that All Might's quirk wasn't the thing that was broken. His body was. Izuku didn't have anything he could do to fix that. Izuku shakes himself from the memory and looks up at Aizawa. Maybe his spirit is looking after Mirio since All Might retired? I've never seen it happen, but I don't know everything. And here I took you for an expert. Aizawa says with such a dry voice that Izuku grids. I wanted to wait on this. He continues, raising a hand to rub at the bridge of his nose. The plan wasn't to just dump Aerie on you first thing either, but... Mirio lost his quirk during the raid. The bullet that hit him was apparently a permanent type. The ones that hit us are theoretically short-term. Izuku winces at the thought of Mirio losing his quirk and remembers how he'd stood in the station and proclaimed loudly that he wouldn't help anymore. He'd been panicked, but it was still so selfish. And then has to process the statement of short term, and how maybe none of this would have happened if he'd just waited it out. He might have to think about that more later, because he's really not sure how to feel about it. There's more important things to focus on anyway. It's been more than a month since the raid, which means Mirio's been without his quirk for that long, which has to be terrible. Izuku tries to push himself off of the bed, only for Aizawa to set a hand against his chest and push him back firmly. What do you think you're doing? Is Mirio here? He'd said something about looking after Eri, so it did make sense if he was by her room. He wonders why Mirio's spirits, or maybe spirits, aren't banging down his theoretical door. I can look and see. Problem, child. Aizawa pushes him back again. You will do no such thing. May I remind you that you were unconscious last night. You gave us all the scare. You need to recover. Mirio has waited this long. He can wait a few days longer. But I might be able to help. Izuku protests, uncomfortable with the idea of just lying back and waiting. You may well be able to. I hope you can, in fact. But it can wait. Aizawa intones in a voice that, for the first time, actually invites no argument. You need to rest. Unless you can tell me truthfully that you're completely back to your normal whatever that is. Izuku looks away because Aizawa is right. He still feels hollowed out, even if he isn't exactly empty. Maybe not normal, he admits grudgingly. But I still need to help Barry. We'll talk about making a reasonable plan for that, Aizawa says a little gentler. It's good that you want to help, but you're not supposed to run yourself dry to do so, all right? We'll take it one step at a time. I don't know enough about your power, but I know teenagers, and I know heroes, and you look like someone suffering from quirk exhaustion, so we're going to treat it like that. All right? I... All right. Izuku can recognize that this is an argument he can't win. So what do we do? Will you be all right if I go speak to the nurses and see if your doctor is back yet? Aizawa looks around their small room and then shakes his head seemingly at himself. Izuku realizes it's because he was looking for spirits when he asks, Not anyone here to keep you company? Not right now, but you can go. I'll be okay as long as it's not... too long? Izuku's hands fist in the blankets over his lap again. It's not... great being here, but it's not too bad. He's not restrained, for one. He's not being drugged. He can handle a few minutes alone. 
All right. As that one nods and pats his clenched hands. It'll be quick. You still have your marker? Izuku blinks up at him, then checks the pocket of his borrowed hoodie, where the sharpie is still tucked next to the knife Aizawa had let him keep. Yes, he shows it. Then we do your marks. Aizawa tells him, it's been more than 12 hours since your shower. Izuku stares at the man and knows he looks surprised, because he is surprised. But the surprise turns into something warm and soft inside his chest. So different than the usual anxiety and tension that lives here. Aizawa had remembered. Aizawa had reminded him. Aizawa had sat by his bed while he had been unconscious and looked after him. And Izuku feels a little misty-eyed as he nods and reaches for his shirt hem to work on the sigils to ward him for the next 12 hours. Aizawa doesn't say anything. He just pats Izuku on the shoulder and promises he'll be back as quickly as he can. He's anemic, like I suspected, Dr. Ogata says without preamble when Shota finds him and they can move to a quiet corner of the hospital floor. This isn't a conversation Shota wants to have with Deku overhearing, at least not yet. I spoke to my colleague about what to test for and he's negative for TB and diabetes and we're running a drug test just to be sure. But if you're worried about use, we should do a full screen. He needs more vitamins in general, but that's to be expected with the brief history you gave, especially D and B and thiamine. You can fix that by getting him to eat a properly balanced diet and some supplements. And I don't think I need to point out. He's underweight. Shouda appreciates Ogata a lot. The man understands him well enough not to sugarcoat anything and gets right to the point. He continues. Nurse Ido checked him over with a quirk and reports he has healed fractures in his wrists and forearms, healed breaks in three fingers that are several years old at this point, a fractured collarbone that happened when he was young, very mild scoliosis, and that he does, in fact, have a toe joint. She only does bones, but she suspects if someone were to check his joints and soft tissues, we'd see similar evidence of trauma. Shouda isn't surprised. It's frankly less of a list than he feared. He's not going to hide the hospitals well. I think he'd have teleported straight out IV and all if he'd had the power to when he woke up. Blind panic. I want to take him home as soon as we can. I'm not worried about drug use, and I can work on getting a full history from him before we run more tests. Ogata nods. Tsuguru, she sent the paperwork over so we can release him into your custody. We've gotten fluids into him, and I'd like to give him a full physical. But treatment can start with you, if you think it will help him from running away again. Shoda thinks about the keening panic Deku had woke with. There's no way in hell they're going to be able to rush this. I'll get us started. He trusts me at the moment, so I'm working on warming him up to the idea of a proper physical in a week or two. If you can ask the nurse to get a baseline of his vitals now, and we can see how that compares to what we saw last night, and the next time he works with Airy, it'll be a good start. Ogata pushes his glasses up on his nose. There may have been far more wrinkled when Shota had seen him last. Airy's quirk had put a lot more youthful elasticity back into his skin. Speaking of which, I want the rest of his sessions with Airy monitored. He's glaring, but it's nowhere near his usual force. It's dangerous to have someone with an unknown, untrusted quirk work on someone so fragile. Notice how you're not suggesting we stop. I'll get the size and shakes his head. Considering our options, I am willing to be more lax in protocol if you are vouching for the boy. Simply put, Aizawa, we can't do much for her here. Frankly, I am going to suggest they pull you from active duty until she's more stable. What? Shota blinks in surprise because the doctor hasn't ever mentioned this before. You were gone for five days by our count, more than five hours away if something had happened on Friday, and then completely lost to us for four days more. In that time, Ares' quirk ate through larger and larger doses of suppressant medication until we were trying to balance between sedating her, controlling her quirk, and not stopping her heart. Coughs cause her such panic that her quirk turns inward and reset her to a point where she was bleeding internally, when we last tried them. Mario has been an asset, but he is also at great risk. I can't just keep older nurses and doctors on hand who are willing to chance being hit by her quirk. It must be monitored. Ogata looks up at Shoda, and his eyes are tired. It's testament to the fact that what felt like hours in Deku's personal hell was far longer for everyone else. What do you suggest? Shota finds himself asking, even though he has a sinking suspicion, to what the rest of this conversation is going to entail. 
Deku's curled on the bed with his knees high against his chest and staring at the door as Shota walks in. The way the kid instantly relaxes is both heartwarming and sad as hell, but he doesn't comment on it. Instead, he gestures to the nurse next to him. They're going to disconnect the IV, and I've already got your paperwork. You're going to be good to go. You look worried, Deku admits, even as he watches the nurse with a hawk-like gaze. She simply sets to work, rolling a cart next to the bed and reaching for Deku's hand, removing the tape and bandage and then the IV, tisking at the fact it had been clamped shut in advance, but saying nothing. She moves to take his blood pressure, and Deku thankfully lets her without complaint. I'll believe the line you would use is that things have become more complicated, but I will explain on the way. We're going to be escorting Eri to UA. We are? Deku sits up straighter as the nurse presses a stethoscope above the cuff. Is she all right? Stable. Shota says, which isn't a yes, and Deku frowns in a way that suggests he knows that much himself. Thankfully, the kid doesn't fight him. The nurse gets the rest of his baseline readings that will go into the scant file they've started on Deku that will hopefully help Shota look after this kid properly. And then she rolls the card away after making Deku promise to listen to Shota and not overexert himself for at least another day. Deku looks frighteningly confused as she leaves, right hand covering the bandage on his left and quiet as Shota comes up to the bed. You all right, problem child? Deku nods and looks up at him with an uneven smile. Been a long time since. Um, I'm just used to nurses being a bit more. He doesn't finish the thought, and Shota doesn't need him to. Tell me if you're not up to walking, and we'll get you a chair. Shota says rather than pressing, but Deku gets up to his feet and seems more stable than he'd have expected. Really, I'm okay, he says, hands instantly hiding in the pockets of Shinsa's hoodie. I don't have a lot of power, but that's not directly connected to me being able to be... Normal, I guess. Something we can hammer out when we get home. Shoda agrees, setting a hand across Deku's back and guiding him to the door. Better to get them moving now, but... We'll be riding with Muriel. He adds before they're out. For now, don't mention his quirk, or what it might look like. That's a conversation he needs to have with you later in private, all right? Sure? Deku shrugs under his hand. I can do that. Thought you could. Shoda agrees and decides the rest can wait until they're on the road. The doctors move quick. Ogata set up matters with Yue, Nezu, and Shujenji before even speaking to Shoda, and so they follow as a sleeping Eri is bundled into an ambulance with a nurse, Mirio sitting up front with the EMT driving, and Shoda and Deku strapped into fold-out seats in the back across from the nurse. Any company with us? Shoda asks as the doors close and Deku spends time just staring around at the interior of the ambulance. No. Deku shakes his head. Makes sense. He mentioned spirits didn't like vehicles much and tended to just follow along with their human. He wonders about how speed works for them, if they have different abilities depending on power and type. But that's a conversation for later. If he winds Deku up on that now, it might last the whole ride. So I know I said you had a place with us. Shona begins, and fuck but Deku tenses before he's even finished saying that much. Which is still the case. I meant what I said. It's not much to start with, but we can change that. And the offer's open. Full stop. I also meant what I said about sponsoring you. For you way. Deku hunches in on himself. I can't go to you way, he says, voice small. I haven't even gone to school properly in... in years, and I don't... I think your quirk has a lot of potential. Shoda says, gentling his voice at how small Deku's made himself at the suggestion. I think you are incredibly intelligent and could become a hero if you wanted to focus on that, or a court counselor, or anything else with the right support. We're going to make sure you can get that. Deku looks up at him, eyes bright. I always dreamed of going to your way, he admits, voice hushed. Do you really think? I do. Shoda nods. You'll have some catching up to do, but we can work on that. But the reason I bring it up is Eri. Eri? The hospital doesn't feel comfortable keeping her in the hero ward when they can't control her quirk. I can, but it's too far from campus or the apartment to get there quickly. I can't stay away from campus. I've already been away for far too long. Sorry. Not your fault. Shoda continues smoothly. So while I am still offering you a place with us in our apartment... 
I am going to be spending however long is needed on campus to monitor Eri. Shinzo stays in the dorms already, so you'd be home with Hizashi in the evenings if you stayed at the apartment, which I know wasn't what I implied. Shota had intended to at least spend a week or two at the apartment in the evenings with the kid and get him settled before returning to the dorms. Would you be all right staying at your way while we look after Eri? Deku looks at Eri and seems to be torn. I don't know, he admits as he watches the rise and fall of her tiny chest. On one hand, it's your way, but a school will have a lot of people in spirits. Whatever you need to do to be comfortable. Shota assures him, you said something about setting wards. Can we do that? Not for the whole school! Deku actually laughs at the suggestion. That'd be... Wow, that'd be a mod? And then I'd be keeping spirits from being able to wash their humans. But if I could set up a room, maybe? Whatever you need. Shota assures him as Eri begins to stir. And look who's waking up. Eri blinks into awareness, worried for a moment, probably at the motion of the ambulance, until their eyes find Aizawa, and she sits up weakly. Aizawa, Sensei! You're back! He reaches to smooth down her hair. At first, it had been one of the few places he could touch her without causing hurt, and now it's just a habit that she seems to appreciate based on the way she leans into it. I'm sorry if I worried you, he tells her. I was fighting a villain and needed rescue. This is Deku. She turns wide eyes to Deku, who looks at her with a smile that starts soft, but grows and grows in brilliance. It's the happiest Shota's ever seen the kid look, and weirdly, it also seems to be genuine. Hello, Eri, Deku tells her. It's nice to meet you properly. Aizawa Sensei has told me so much about you. Deku's got a quirk that lets him repair quirks like yours, Shota tells her. We're going to be staying at UA for the next few days so that we can look after you while I ensure my class doesn't burn the building down. Eri giggles at him almost silently, but it's still an achievement. When he'd first said anything similar to her, she would simply assumed he was telling the truth and stared at him. Now she looks around the ambulance and says hello to the quiet nurse before looking back to Shota. Where's Mirio? I'm just sitting up front, Eri! He calls from the passenger seat. I can do it no day! Yes, she says quietly, then looks up at Shota. I heard someone again. Dr. Ogata, he asks, and she nods. You didn't hurt him. Your quirk activated, and he's a bit younger than he was last week, but he isn't hurt or upset at you for it. She doesn't look like she believes him, and Shota makes a note to get the doctor to video call them as soon as they have her settled. Taku, meanwhile, points out the stickers that adorn Eri's IV and asks her where they're from. When he admits he's never heard of idle heart mermaid stars and asks her to tell him about it, Shota thinks, <laughs> well, he thinks Aerie's going to have another stout supporter. Good. She needs all the help she can get, and looking after her might keep Deku from panicking too much about Yue. Yue is everything Izuku ever dreamed of, and also kind of terrifying. Aizawa offers him a room in the dorms with the other first-year students, and Izuku instantly says no to that. That's too much. He's not a student, and he's not a hero, and he's sticking out like a soft man. He considers the offer to just stay in the apartment with President Mike, but he doesn't really know him, not really, and it feels too much like he'll be interfering and just be a pain. He doesn't want to cause trouble. The compromise is a room next to Ares, next to the infirmary. Aizawa warns him he'll probably hear a lot because a hero school employs someone like Recovery Girl for a reason. But Izuku reminds him he stayed in rented rooms for a while now and he's used to all sorts of things. And Aizawa just does the frown not frown thing where he's trying not to look conflicted about something that's normal for Izuku and he lets it go. He'd worried that the room would remind him too much of the care facility he'd been placed in. But Aizawa had actually thought of that too. The hospital bed is instantly wheeled out, and a dorm room bed is brought in. The white bed sheets are replaced with dark green, same for the pillows, and someone brings in a plant in a pot. Not a little bunch of flowers to go in the windowsill, an actual potted plant as tall as Izuku. And then they'd given him his backpack. Izuku still can't believe it, really, but they'd apparently checked the buildings and found his stuff and just 
brought it all back in case it had clues to where he'd taken Aizawa. And they hadn't damaged anything. All his gofu were there, stocked and waiting, and his spare clothes and his notebooks, which they probably read, which is really embarrassing, and his little first aid kit and his emergency blanket and his actual woven blanket. They left the futon, which was probably for the best, really, and his water bottle is missing, but that's it. Now he sets up the wards all around the room. Aizawa had given him tape and said it was okay to use that on the walls, and Azuku takes him at his word. By the time he's done, his thumbs hurt a bit. Adding blood to the paper prayers makes them a lot stronger, he's found. And every corner and wall of the room is warded. Izuku feels safe for the first time in days. Nothing is ever broken through his wards as long as they're maintained. He thinks they'll hold even against Ares' spirit. He hopes Tamamo no mate doesn't take offense. He hasn't seen her since she helped with Mizushi. He kind of hopes the two of them are catching up, since Ares' spirit also hasn't made an appearance since last night. He curls on the bed to rest a bit, marveling at clean sheets and soft pillows that aren't at all the hard, dense foam he remembers from the facility, and he doesn't even realize he's fallen asleep until Aizawa knocks on his door that evening with a plate of food and a promise to give Izuku a tour of the school now that classes are done. Touring the school is amazing! And Aizawa seems to enjoy watching Izuku flail because he never tells him to be quiet or stop talking, even as Izuku goes off on tangent after tangent about the various heroes who graduated from UA or teach here. It's actually really nice to get to just walk and talk with Aizawa and for it to be relaxed, even as the hero points out the teacher's lounge and Nezu's office and the auditorium and the East Training Gymnasium and the West Training Grounds and where the USJ is in the distance. And Izuku is too happy to be inside UA to dwell too hard on why he'd never been able to even apply to it when he turned 15. Aizawa prods him gently on his nata quirk, and they set up a plan for looking after Eri with sessions every evening after classes, because Aizawa wants to be there to supervise with the nurse, but he needs to get back to his actual job teaching 1A, of course. Izuku wants to try for more, but the look Aizawa gives him says he's going to get scalded if he suggests it. What about Mirio? He asks as they head back to his borrowed room. Muriel will speak to you, and we'll see how you feel after your session with Harry tomorrow. All right. Izuku nods and yawns as Aizawa puts him to bed. I'll be in the dorms, but the nurse next door can call me if you need me. He tells Izuku as Izuku fights to keep his eyes open. He hasn't had someone put him to bed since his mother died, and his whole chest feels warm as Aizawa tucks blankets around him with gentle hands. I'll drop by at lunch tomorrow. All right. And we'll go shopping Sunday to get you more necessities. Try to stay out of trouble until then. Izuki manages to grin. But then I wouldn't be a problem child. You'd be a problem child, even if you sat quietly in a corner all day with your hands in your lap. Aizawa tells him, but he says it with warmth and a smile in his eyes. So it makes Izuku feel good, not sad. Just do your best. All right. Izuku promises, and Aizawa brushes his hand through his messy hair, and it's so warm that Izuku falls asleep thinking that maybe things will actually, finally, maybe be okay. The next few days take on a pattern, except for one thing. Mirio is totally avoiding him. Eri says that Mirio visits, but Friday passes and Izuku catches no sight of him, and Saturday he waits with his door open and still sees nothing, and he starts to think he's done something wrong when he finally hears Aerie's quiet whisper of a giggle coming from her room in the late afternoon. He creeps over and feels almost bad for not knocking, but he peeks inside and there's Aerie in Mirio's lap in the bed, the two of them reading a giant book, and Mirio making animal noises. Where's my cat? Is that my cat? Mirio reads, expressions exaggerated. It goes, oh, it is a hippopotamus. That's not my cow. The hmm line is said with such effort that Mirio's face turns red. Eri giggles all the more. Izuku decides to leave them to it, but also might decide to park himself on the floor outside Eri's room and wait for him to emerge. He sits with his brand new notebook, legs crossed, and leans against the door frame and jots down everything he knows about his quirk and how it works with other quirks and what he's been able to do. 
Aizawa had called it homework, and Izuku is honestly pretty excited to turn jumbled thoughts into something cohesive, especially with proper materials to do so. Aizawa had shown up the day before with handfuls of school supplies and a promise to let Izuku pick out his own on Sunday, but he wants to get started now. It's probably a solid hour before the door opens and Muriel literally tries to creep out. Izuku looks up at him and waves. Hoi! Muriel jumps four feet in the air. Arr! Izuku scrambles to his feet. Sorry! He says as Muriel clutches at his chest dramatically. I just... I really wanted to talk to you, but I didn't want to interrupt your time with Ari. She really seems to enjoy it, and she needs to relax and not worry, but I wanted to talk to you. I was worried you might be upset and... Mirio holds up his hands just the way Izuku does when he's trying to calm someone down. And it's so familiar, Izuku stops long enough for Mirio to interject. I'm not upset! He assures, worried, but warm. You didn't do anything wrong, I just wanted to give you time! I didn't want to pressure you or push and, uh... My quirks! Mirio sags and a hand goes behind his head to tug at the hair at the nape of his neck. It kind of surprised me what you said before, and it's complicated. Complicated? Makes Izuku laugh. Well, everything about me is complicated, and I want to help. So if you want to get your quirk back, would it be okay if I tried? Are you sure? Mirio hesitates, but there's open lying in his expression. I know you've been helping Ari, and it leaves you tired. I'm sure. Warming up the ice field that is Aerie's quirk was already easier after a day. There's already green grass growing in the little space he sits in, and Izuku doesn't think reconnecting a quirk will be like repairing Aerie's. They've never really taken much energy. I want to at least try. If I think it'll take a lot, we can decide if I should keep going, or if I should stop and wait. Mirio shifts from one foot to the other. If you're sure. Izuku gestures next door. Do you want to do it in my room? As that was said, you need to talk about it. Mirio nods and the two of them troop inside. Izuku shuts the door as Mirio sits in the desk chair and Izuku takes a moment to pull down three of the wards that protect the wall by the door and the door itself. Mirio looks at him in confusion as he holds the gofu in one hand and Izuku flushes a bit as he sets them on the desk. They keep your spirit out and that it'd be rude if I'm working on your quirk. He explains, moving to sit on the edge of the bed. Um... I mean, what did Aizawa tell you about how I see things? That quirks manifest to you as creatures you can see and manipulate. Mirio answers easily. Prayers keep them out. Complicated. Izuku decides to go with rather than explain all the details right now, even if Mirio seems really nice. It's complicated, but yeah, they listen to wards, so I don't have to worry about them. Sometimes they uh, get upset when I'm around because they don't like that I can see them. That's what happened the other night with Harry. Mirio nods, frowning in thought. You told Sir they spoke to you. It must be hard hearing and seeing something no one else can. Izuku blinks. Ah, uh, um, yes, yes, it's hard. Understatement of the year, but also he's far too surprised that Mirio just believing him. He doesn't even sound doubtful. But there's some good things. I get to help people when their quirks don't quite work right. I always said they told me about the little girl you helped. Mirio enthuses, smiling brightly. And of course, Eri and all the heroes you helped already. Izuku has to laugh at how bright Mirio is. This is a pretty nice change from everyone thinking I'm a villain or a weird experiment. Mirio looks away at that. I'm sorry, he offers, so suddenly sad that Izuku has to flail palms out. You don't need to apologize. I was mostly joking. It was just a misunderstanding, and I think I would have thought the same in their place. I mean, I'm really weird. He drills off as Muriel's shoulders sag more. Sir was the one who thought that, and he's the one who told all the other heroes about you. Muriel's voice is quiet and sad. I think he would have liked to meet you properly. He'd like you once he understood. Sir finally clicks as Sir Night Eye, and Izuku thinks he might doubt the idea that the hero would trust him. But he also can't bring himself to argue with Mirio over the hero when he died to help save Eri. It's obvious Mirio liked him a lot and might even have been there when Night Eye was killed from what Aizawa had said. I'm sorry he's gone, Izuku tells him and means it even if Night Eye had frightened him, he'd still been an amazing hero. Me too, Mirio nods, but then he forces himself to smile. 
It doesn't ring his eyes. And he makes a fist. That's why I want to be the best hero I can be! Plus Ultra! I want to live up to everything he taught me! Well then, let's fix your quirk! Izuku pastes a smile on his face to match and digs out his ever-present marker. Aizawa had given him five, all different colors. I just need to mark your hand. I, um, first All Might said you recognized All Might's quirk. Izuku nods. His spirit was next to you when I finished helping Eri. At first I thought it was yours somehow, but then I realized he was probably just looking after you. Aizawa's spirit looked after me, and you're All Might's successor, Aizawa said. Mirio's smile falters for a moment, and then he looks at the door. Aizawa said I should tell you because you can keep secrets. Izuku blinks. Of course. I wouldn't share anything you didn't want me to, unless I thought I really had to. I mean, if it was dangerous or someone was going to get hurt. Mirio laughs awkwardly, hand behind his head. The weird thing is, Aizawa technically doesn't even know, though I guess he's guessed. Oh my, didn't tell him I asked, but... Mirio trails off and Izuku waits. If Mirio wants to tell him, he can be patient. And if he changes his mind, that's okay too. Eventually, Mirio takes a breath and his smile turns into something a lot more wry and less brilliant. When Aizawa-sensei said I was All Might's successor, he was right. Izuku nods and waits. I have his quirk, he continues. I mean, he gave me his quirk. It can be passed down from hero to hero, and that's why it's a secret, because if anyone knew... You'd have all sorts of villains after you. Izuku breathes out in instant sympathetic horror. Wow, I've never heard of a quirk like that. I mean, I wonder how it started. Do you know how many people have had it before you? I wonder if the spirit meant for that to happen originally. He never said anything when I met him before. Oh, when did All Might give you his quirk? Was it after the fight in Kamino? I know he retired after that, so... Mirio cuts him off, which is maybe good because Izuku's mind is going a mile a minute. It was before, Camino, he says, looking a bit overwhelmed at Izuku's questions. At uh, Whoops, he should probably be more careful, but at least Mirio isn't yelling. I don't know how much I should tell you. We would prefer he told you nothing at all, Mirio. All night, Spirit says, walking through the unwarded wall. We want nothing to do with you. Izuku hesitates because Mirio believes him, but Mirio also might second guess that if he hears him just talking to thin air. I just want to fix his connection to you, you and his other spirit. I haven't seen them yet. Because they are we, and we are us. The spirit pads closer, but it at least isn't being aggressive, which isn't that much of a reassurance when it very nearly fills the front half of the room. We are one and all, and all in one. He's never met a spirit quite like this before with a voice layered and echoing in his head. Thank you, Mirio says cautiously. Are you okay? Uh, yeah, um, your spirit showed up. Sorry. Oh! Mirio looks around but obviously sees nothing. Um, could you tell him I'm sorry about getting shot? The spirit gives the biggest sigh Izuku has ever heard, and he can't help it. He laughs. Sorry, he admits as the spirit and Mirio both look at him. I mean, I don't think anyone thinks you got shot on purpose, Mirio. It takes some of the tension out of the room as Mirio ducks his head and his spirit sits on the floor in front of them, tucking his legs under his body like a big cat. Which he is, just with a lot of extras. He doesn't remember him having horns before, but maybe it just like wearing various things like accessories. You may call me one for all, the spirit says, unaware of Izuku's mental catalog of his parts. Many will understand what that means. Okay, he says his name is one for all, Izuku repeats, and Mirio reels back in surprise. Did I say something wrong? No, no, not at all, just, uh, ha! Huh? say that anywhere someone else get here it's a secret mirio looks a little panicked how did you know his name have you seen him your spirit before or all might it's the first time izuku's ever met someone who knew their spirit's name it's the name of my quirk all mites i mean what for all is the name of the quirk that gets passed down and it's a secret please mirio looks pained 
It's hard to make someone who's only just met you trust that you'll keep their secrets, but Izuku does his best. I won't say anything. I promise. I think actually, from what he's saying, is that well, whatever spirit your cork was before, it's now part of him. He looks to the lion creature and it nods its giant head slowly. But when you, when All Might gave you his cork, did it take away your original cork? It was permeation, right? Muriel frowns. My cork got stronger, but mostly I just got All Might's strength. I was learning how to use it, use both, without using too much, but they both worked fine until the bullet. Muriel looks toward the closed door, thoughtful. We know maybe Amy can use her quirk to help me, but she's so afraid of her quirk of hurting people. I don't know if she'd ever even want to try. From what Aries said to him already, Izuku can understand that. Hopefully it won't come to that. I'll try. That is, if one for all doesn't mind. Wait, does he not want to? Mirio straightens up and looks around the room. Because if he doesn't, I don't know if we should... It's Izuku's turn to be surprised and taken aback as Mirio worries about something that... No one else before this week had ever really believed were real, besides his mom. And here Mirio was worrying about if he should get his quirk back. Said spirit sighs again, heavily, and actually rolls its eyes at Mirio. Tell this child I am angry at those who created the bullets, not at him. As for you, I know what you are. Izuku sighs to echo the spirit. I'm the bridge, yes, but I really haven't earned any of the other names everyone calls me. I really don't want to hurt you or take your power or anything like that. I told Mizushi the same thing I tell everyone. I want to help humans and I help spirits who ask me. That's it! One for all snorts and smoke trails from his nose. Izuku wonders if he can breathe fire as well. He really wants to ask what kind of spirit he is, but this isn't really the time or place for it. That remains to be seen. You are young. Age makes monsters out of men. Izuku doesn't mean to get upset. He really doesn't. But it's just not fair. Don't you think treating me like I'm some villain and beating me up and calling me names all the time might maybe be a self-fulfilling prophecy? Why does everyone think I'm just going to rip out your names and use you when I did it once to one spirit when I didn't know what I was doing and then the other time it's been in self-defense and I never keep anyone for myself? It's just... Duh! His hands fizzed in his bedspread and then he remembers Mirio is watching him and God is making a fool of himself and Izuku covers his face with his hands for a moment and just breathes deeply. You know what? Never mind. Never mind. Mirio, he isn't angry at you. One for all, I just need to know if you'll let me fix this. Are you okay? Mirio asks gently. Spirits don't like me, Izuku tells him without any energy to try to soften the fact. He rubs at his forehead and around his temples because it lets go of some of the tension there. They usually assume I'm going to try to enslave them, and it's just... It's a thing. I'm fine. He'd had two spirits, one after another, Tamamo no Mei and Nosagi, be kind to him and understand that he just wanted to help. Apparently that was going to be his max for the foreseeable future. He just needs to say if he's going to fight me. Why? You could force me, even if I say no. Would you withhold his power from him? Oh, for- Izuku bites at his bump so he doesn't scream. It helps him sound sane and stable when he snaps out a reply. Yes! In fact, Mirio, if your quirk didn't want to come back, would you expect me to force it? Mirio recoils back from him. Of course not! Why would I do that? Yeah, me neither, and yet we're having this conversation. Izuku glares at one for all. So yes, no, or say if you need more time and we'll wait. The scorpion tail flicks back and forth like a cat's, but Izuku is too tired of this to be intimidated. He stares and waits, and the spirit stares and waits, and finally it's the one to look away. Fix us if you can. Not the most glowing of acceptances, but he'll take it. Izuku gestures to Mirio for his hand. Okay, he stopped Soul King, he says, which makes the spirit bristle and Mirio grin. So Izuku takes it as a win. Let's see what we can do. It's okay if it doesn't work, Mirio assures, even though Izuku can tell it would be very much not okay. He appreciates how hard Mirio was trying for his sake. I'm going to do my best. 
Izuku promises him as he adds the sigil to his own hand. He's done this more in the last few months than he's done in the previous 12. It's actually nice being able to do something good for people with what he can do. He closes his eyes and reaches out toward the connection with Mirio and his disconnected power. Fields of wheat, shelves of books, deep black oceans, and mazes of tall dead hedges. Izuku's seen all sorts of echoes of a person's self. This is the first time he's looked at someone's core and felt like his face was about to melt off. He rocks back into himself, blinking sunspots from his eyes that aren't really there, but somehow are at the same time. Ouch! What happened? Mirio's instantly leaning in, looking him over and worried. Are you okay? Did something attack you? Izuku almost wants to hug Mirio, or at least give him something really very nice, for the fact that he's the first person to take Izuku's explanations at face value like this. Instead, he shakes his head and drags up a smile. No, I'm okay. Your power just, uh, surprised me. You're very... bright! Bright? It felt like looking into the sun, Izuku admits. He has no idea why Mirio laughs so hard, but he accepts the invitation out to dinner later with Mirio and his classmates, including Sun Eater, when Mirio promises he'll understand better to meet them. Reaching back, he's better prepared for the intensity this time and can find the looming darkness that seems to separate Mirio's bright light and his spirit's power. And what power! Mirio's brilliant as a sun, but one for all feels like Izuku's discovered a supernova. He can't even imagine trying to tap into that power for himself, even if he wanted to. He thinks he'd melt. When he comes back to himself properly the second time after clearing away the darkness and ensuring that Mirio's spirit is properly tethered to his human, new or otherwise, Izuku opens his eyes and instantly slaps his hands off of them. You're, you're close, he tells Mirio, feeling his face heat up. Mirio's laughing, though, faced halfway through the chair and whooping with joy, and Izuku can't help but laugh as well. Aizawa, true to his word, takes Izuku shopping on Sunday. It passes in a bit of a blur. The initial plan of going to a mall works for two stores before Izuku is constantly being tripped, pushed, or knocked around. There's just too many people, which means too many spirits, and if he apologizes to Aizawa one more time, he thinks the man might actually yell at him for it. Instead, Aizawa takes them outside with what purchases they had managed. Some t-shirts, some track pants, some shorts, because it's still hot, plus socks and underwear. Izuku does not want to admit he's the most excited about the new socks and underwear. They move to smaller stores after that, though Aizawa has to call someone to ask for advice on where to go. And then Aizawa uses his quirk just randomly and aimed at no one specific. Aizawa? Izuku asks, looking around in confusion. She show up yet? He replies, and Izuku realizes he's calling for Tamamo no Mei. A moment later, she does appear in her fox form, and she looks up at Aizawa, and then to Izuku curiously. Oh, she's here, Izuku tells the man. Good, can she keep the spirits around you from bugging you while we shop? Oh yeah, that's not... She's not... Izuku starts because this is not what spirits do, and Aizawa could at least ask nicely. Tell him I will watch out for you. Tamamo no Mei laughs, though if you avoid more crowded areas, that would help. I can feel the ire directed at you from here, and even I have my limits. Izuku relays the information, and Aizawa just nods at where Izuku had been looking. Good, thanks, let's go. Izashi says there are shops down the street that should be quieter. Quieter is still busy for a city so close to Tokyo, but it's better than a mall, and Izuku finds himself with new shoes and a new backpack, more stationery and notebooks, toiletries, so he isn't using tiny sample ones from midnight, and then Aizawa takes them to a cell phone dealer, and Izuku panics. You don't need to, he says, flailing a bit. I have a phone, I just... a SIM card? I usually only use it for Wi-Fi at hotspots because it doesn't have a connection. Aizawa gives him the most dismissive look Izuku's seen from him. The phone with the crack through the screen. That one. It mostly works, Izuku tries. That doesn't work. 
At least he tells himself Aizawa is buying one of the lower and less expensive phones, and it isn't on a contract. At least Aizawa knows better than to plan for Zuku staying forever, because, well, what if things change? What if the spirits get too annoying and they can't deal with him? What if Hitoshi doesn't like sharing his parents? Izuku wants this, but he's also going to be realistic. It's better to plan for when things go wrong so that he can land on his feet and keep going. He doesn't want to cause anyone trouble. He doesn't want to be a bother. He doesn't want Aizawa to regret giving him even this much. Yamada too has a surprise for him when they get back to UA, just in time to do another session with Eri, whose quirk is improving in leaps and bounds. The teacher is dressed in casual clothes with his hair tied back and in a comfortable looking long sleeved shirt, holding a box that he pushes into Izuku's hands the minute they appear in the corridor. There you are! He says, and Izuku's already gotten used to the volume that Yamada speaks in. Shana here asked me to run my own errand for you while you two are out. There you go. Let me know if anything doesn't work. I got a jet. It's game night with Namori and Sekijiro, and they're going to eat all the snacks if I'm late. Izuku stares down at the box as Yamada pats Aizawa on the shoulder and dashes off down the hall. It's a laptop. It's a laptop! They are giving him a laptop! Aizawa sighs. It's only logical problem, child. Now, don't cry. We needed something for you to do school work on. On Tuesday, Izuku gets called to Mr. Principal's office for some testing, which Aizawa had assured him was just a way to see where Izuku stood on standardized levels so that they knew where to start with getting him back up to speed. Izuku's not sure it's worth it. He's probably way too far behind to ever qualify for UA even with help, but he can't say he doesn't want it. He technically had online schooling once he'd been put in the facility, and when he'd escaped, they'd never deactivated his account. He'd tried to spend as much time as he could in the library working on assignments, trying to keep up on the off chance that he'd maybe one day be able to get off the streets and get a proper job somewhere. Math had been the hardest, but he'd actually liked most subjects, and the librarians never bothered him when they saw what he was working on. He has no idea if it's going to be of any help, but all he can do is try his best. And he does. There's written tests, those are familiar, and oral tests. Izuku's English isn't very good, he knows. And then Mr. Principal asks him questions. Questions about spirits, questions about quirks, questions about heroes, questions about hero laws, and vigilantes, and All Might's Rise, and the hero scoring system, and meal plans, and what the economy of Kotobuchiko had been like compared to Minami Ward, and Izuku's head is swimming by the time he's done, and the clock reads well past four. Class is out for the day. Good luck, Principal Nezu says, his dark eyes so sharp in his small face. Above him is his quirk that he'd asked Izuku about, a giant burning mandala that had said nothing the entire time, even when Izuku had greeted it. Intimidating, but after meeting Mizuchi and One for All, not nearly as intimidating as it could be. The principal dismisses Izuku without any real indication of how well he's done and sends him off to meet with Aizawa. He's glad that the hallways are empty. Izuku's tried to avoid anything where the students might be because their spirits sometimes like to just get in his way, and he doesn't want to look even stranger than he already must. The weird kid with the visitor's badge around a lanyard on his neck, not even in any uniform. Thankfully, he's been able to hide in his room when class is in session, and he and Eri have lunch together brought up to them by a teacher so he can avoid the cafeteria. He really hasn't needed to cross paths with anyone much, and so he's relaxed as he heads back from Nezu's office, lost in thought as he makes his way toward the teacher's lounge. He's very nearly there when a voice shouts out, Daku! He turns and is faced with a taller blonde boy with a scowl on his face, a sloppy uniform, and a vaguely familiar-looking spirit, one Izuku thinks he's seen in passing, at least, though that doesn't say much. Hey, Daku! What the fuck?! The last word is emphasized by a small explosion in the other boy's hands, flaring loud and bright but brief. Some sort of explosive quirk? Izuku doesn't remember seeing that in the sports festival, but maybe the student had to abstain. He backs up as the other boy storms closer, and Izuku has to duck and dodge away as the blonde tries to pin him against the wall. What are you doing? Izuku has to ask, flabbergasted. He's been in the school for days. Everyone should know that he's no longer a person of interest by now. Did you not get the memo? Oh, Izawa brought me here. 
What the hell do you think you're even doing here, shitty Deku? The explosions pop off again, and Izuku tries to dodge from the hands, but the other boy is fast and trained. He catches him and slams Izuku against the wall hard. One hand stays bald in his shirt. The other sparks dangerously close to his face. The boy's spirit, surprisingly, keeps its distance. I don't know what the fuck you think you were doing getting involved with villains! The boy growls with a voice like gravel. I knew you were a desperate idiot, but I never thought you'd be that desperate! Izuku stares in the blood-red eyes and tries to think about who he might be able to call on to help right now. He takes a chance, feeling guilty as he does so, and tugs on the name Tamamo no Mei. To the boy in front of him, he asks, Who are you, exactly? He does not expect the punch, which he really probably should have braced for. He's no stranger to fights. There were plenty of bullies growing up, and then the spirits, and then being a skinny homeless kid without a gang or any real affiliation. He ought to know he's dealing with someone violent when they advertise it this loudly. But he's gotten soft, staying in the school with Aizawa and his family. He's going to have to be careful about that going forward. For now, Izuku picks himself up. He doesn't get far before there's a hand on his shoulder, peppering it with tiny burns. It's burning through his shirt. His new shirt that Aizawa bought for him. It had been a gift and this, this bully is burning it. Tamamo no Mei appears in that instant, and Izuku is so furious he barely uses words. Later, he'll realize that they did something in seconds that usually takes him far longer, but he reaches out and she accepts, and the burning stops the snap and crackle of explosions. Stop, and the blonde asshole again steps back in shock and horror. What the fuck did you do? You're using your quirk on a civilian in your school, unlawfully in front of the teacher's lounge, against someone who can manipulate quirks. Izuku spits out each word as he checks his shirt for damage, more dismayed by the pockmarked holes than the blisters on his skin. What do you think I did? Are you stupid? Izuku wonders why the teachers haven't appeared yet. They have to be hearing this. Are they actually like his old school, where student fighting wasn't their problem after school hours? Because this seems really stupid! The blind screams, and it's guttural and full of rage and both frightening and... If Izuku has to admit, a little pathetic. It's a bit like watching a toddler throw a fit just scaled up, except then the blonde throws himself forward, and while Izuku's got a basic knowledge of hard knocks and a borrowed power that lets him stop quirks, he sure as hell can't hold his own against someone actually trained to new arm. He goes down hard, and the boy gets another punch in screaming about all for one in quirks, fist crashing into Izuku's cheek so hard he tastes blood. Izuku's ready to call on something bigger for help and burn a favor for it, but before he can, the boy is yanked back suddenly, his weight flying away from Izuku's chest so that Izuku can scramble back to try to get away. The other boy is wrapped in Aizawa's capture cloth, fighting back even as the fabric tightens around him. Aizawa's looming over them both, quirk activated and expression furious. And Izuku suddenly can't breathe all over again because he's in trouble. He's going to get kicked out. It was always his fault when a fight happened. Always! Aizawa shakes the boy in his grip. Bakugo. He intones and called Fiori. What the fuck do you think you're doing? Sensei! The blonde. Okay, back ago. Izuku files that away. Stops struggling. Deku's quirkless! Or he was when we were kids! His quirk now has to come from, from him! His eyes are wide, and Izuku realizes, now that he's not, you know, fighting him off, that this Bakugo doesn't look entirely well. He's sweating, for one thing, and his face is pale. He's working for them! Oh, so this is the villain thing again. Somehow. Though, I don't know who you are, he admits, and then wonders if he should. His memory is full of holes for a reason. Like, fuck, you forgot! Bakugo starts. How do you know, Deku? Aizawa says before Bakugo can continue, still furious. Izuku realizes the door to the teacher's lounge is open a crack. They were probably all pressed to it, listening. It was a shitty corkless kid who followed me around for fucking years, crying every time he stubbed his toe. Bakugo shouts. Izuku thinks he might be a bit like Yamada, just always said that that volume. He fucking called me Kachan. Then he sneers at Izuku, not seeing the way Aizawa goes stiff at the revelation. Who the fuck do you think gave you the name Shitty Deku? Wait, Izuku gets up. You're the one who gave me a terrible nickname, and you're the one who's upset I forgot about you? You're really full of yourself. 
That's that's about to go off again, even while still wrapped in Aizawa's weapon. Aizawa has to flare his quirk once more, and his next sentence strikes Bakugo dead still and horrified. This is grounds for expulsion, Katsuki. Bakugo. Bakugo, Katsuki, Katsuki, Bakugo, Izuku will last later. Gapes like a fish. Izuku actually feels bad for him, even while rubbing at his bruised jaw. At least he can see Recovery Girl for this, instead of just waiting for it to heal up or spending another favor with Zahira. Sensei. Bakugo pleads, but he doesn't seem to know what to say. Typical Izuku thinks. The few times anyone had ever confronted bullies for him, they'd never known what to say back about that besides fuck off or mind your own business. And this clearly is Azawa's business. Still, what would expelling him prove? Izuku asks as he wrung his tongue over his teeth and the inside of his cheek. Aizawa and Bakugo both look at him and Izuku shrugs even if the motion hurts. I mean, I guess if he's done this a lot before and you've talked to him, I don't know. But I thought you wait, you're supposed to teach you to be better? Not the... He looks at the wide-eyed kid. Not to throw a whole person out even if they're actually jerks? Daku! Bakugo snaps but it doesn't have as much force to it. I don't need your shitty help! While he's arguing that I shouldn't expel you. And at least Aizawa no longer looks like he's about to erupt. He also starts to relax the capture weapon, and Makago is smart enough not to launch an Izuku again. Do you know Deku's name? Makago sputters for a moment, rolling his eyes. Of course I know the idiot's name, it's... And he stops, making a face, and then staring at Izuku. What the fuck can't I remember it? I know it, it's on the tip of my tongue, I just get... Ah! Explosions pop from his hands again, though clearly just as emphasis, not as a threat. Did you do this? He glares at Izuku demanding, You did this! He declares almost instantly afterwards. Izuku has to laugh because of course he comes across an old bully who knew him before, and of course it would be all his fault. Aizawa maybe sees that the laughter isn't exactly a happy sort, because he puts a hand on Bakugo's shoulder and turns him around to face him directly while Izuku tries to collect himself. You're under house arrest for attacking a guest and using your quirk offensively. We will be talking about this. I want you to write an essay on Mitchell's treaties on quirk rarity and include three current quirks that do not fit on that scale and extrapolate how they may evolve through the next generation. Do Friday. Bakugo seems to know when he's lost. He stares at the ground, hands jammed into the pockets of his baggy pants. Yes, I'd say. And you're benched from all hero training for a week. Aizawa adds, which is probably an insult to injury. Bakugo starts, but then just hunkers down more. <laughs> yes, I'd say. Go to the dorms. We'll talk later. Aizawa directs and nudges Bakugo out and along the hall. He waits until he disappears before coming up to Izuku, apologetic. Are you alright? He burnt the shirt you bought me, Izuku points out, but he's a little calmer about it now. He seemed... Beyond the knowing me part, he was afraid? Aizawa gives him a long look, lips pressed in a thin line. Do you remember helping rescue him from the League of Villains? No, Izuku frowns, then puts two and two together considering the timing. Oh, wow. I guess he was the memory I gave up to get us home. He wonders if Aizawa remembers what he'd said. Probably based on the way Aizawa looks sad and sympathetic and angry all at once. Hi. Aizawa shakes his head, clearly bothered by this. I think so. Izuku reaches up and pats him on the arm in awkward sympathy. It's okay, he assures him, because obviously he'd been right to give that up to get them back in one piece. It was worth it.